considers it really, really critical to have a diverse workforce and not simply because um, it's the right thing to do because we know there are commercial benefits that come out of it. And let me just cite an example of something that brought this home recently. Uh, some of you may know Juliet Burke. She's actually a partner at Deloitte um, and has written an amazing book called Which Two Heads Are Better Than One, which is actually a bestseller in business terms uh, and launched last year. Now, in that book, she actually quotes some research from Columbia University that actually reflects some, um, I think the research was done in 2014, that said the GFC could have been averted if you had a more diverse group of traders, because it was very homogenous, and regardless of the race, a homogenous group actually does result in less effective outcomes. So what they did was actually do a simulation of the same circumstances across the US and Singapore, and what they found at the end of that is that they had a control group, which was the homogenous group, and then you had the diverse group. And the diverse group had um, a 30% increase in pricing accuracy on the trading floor than the homogenous group. And what they drew from that, in terms of why the drivers of that, is that when you actually have a culturally diverse group, they actually challenge the thinking of the rest of the group. So you don't have that kind of group think. Also, it brings a kind of diversity in terms of experience. And so that consolidated view is much better than the mono-ethnic view. So that's one example of why we know it's commercially viable. So quality, especially in our leadership ranks. I'm delighted to announce that at this point in time, we're 49.9% in terms of our women in leadership, which is amazing. We've got to the end of next month to actually land at the 50%. Very aspirational figure that Gail set many, many years ago, which at the time we were all just thinking, no way is this going to happen. So to move to our next focus, it's actually cultural diversity in our leadership ranks. And we're doing that through three very distinct ways. So one of the ways we're actually trialing is, and again, I won't bore you with the research, but we know that there is cultural bias in the assessment of resumes and CVs that come through. So what we're doing is doing a trial of blind CVs. So the name is taken out. And what we found, um, again, ANU did some research on this. Um, at the time, I think it was 2010, if you had a Chinese sounding name, you had it was it took you 68% times more um, CVs going out to actually get to interview. If you had a Middle Eastern sounding name, at that point in time, it was 64% more that you had to actually put your CV out versus the, the hallmark, which is the Anglo-Saxon. So knowing that, we're actually trialing this to make sure that we kind of remove some of the unconscious bias that happens in that space. The other thing is we're starting to track you know, baseline the proportion of leaders that we consider at a certain level. The trick here is people don't actually identify on our people systems as having a culturally diverse background, so we're trying to navigate um, the difficulty with that. But it's a primary focus, and we've got multiple strategies that we're actually putting in place to address that as the next big focus. Leadership by 2020, and so we look at the top three levels of our organisation in terms of that representation, and because the leadership representation there is relatively small compared to the general workforce it's easier to track um, whether someone is from an Asian background that way um, because we have so few Asian leaders there we do know who they are and so we are quite um, confident that we have that piece of data accurate. And, and how important is it um, to both of you, I'll, I'll come to you in a minute Alfred, to have um, leadership really uh, culturally diverse or, or, or you know, re represented. I mean, you, you cited some figures, um, there's uh, some research there, um, but in terms of for your business, how important is it, as it for an organisation that your leadership is quite representative of, of the, the workforce that you have? Um, so for the Star Entertainment Group, we have a really strong business case. Um, we collectively speak over 70 languages as a workforce. We have over 50% of our most valuable guests are of an Asian background, and that has been um, analysed through our marketing data. And about 40% of our frontline workforce are of an Asian background. So we want to make sure that our leadership is representative of the diversity of our workforce, of our customers and our local communities. 
for our employees to have role models in those positions because that's what garners, you know, you can see somebody who looks like you, sounds like you, that is actually at those tables, you know, having those discussions with those people. So it's quite critical and it's the next big bastion that we have to actually tackle. Important to have um, a culturally diverse team because, uh, as, a, as a global company launching into different sectors, especially manufacturing goods in Asia, uh, I think it's really important to have someone who understands the culture. Um, what we find is like a lot of big uh, American companies will come in and go, We need this faster, we need this cheaper, we need this better. But by yelling at that person doesn't actually guarantee you anything like that's going to happen. Um, so, like we found by understanding their culture, by having uh, you know a lot of Asian employees ourselves, um, that you know treating them nicely and you know taking them out to dinner and then you know going through the respect chains um, actually gets you the better results with your company um, than you would have. So, if you had two teams and you had um, one um, that was culturally diverse but exactly the same skills as one that was everyone that was the same culture, I would always go for the one that was more diverse. Uh, because you can build a more globalized um, company and more globalized product as a startup, and it does give you some edge. Yeah. To every single employee. So originally, it wasn't actually uh, available to every single employee. So we've recently taken that decision and rolled it out. So it's our online social learning platform, and it's got some amazing stuff on leadership on there, and it's actually available to every employee anywhere, anytime, on any device. So that's something that launched within the last three months. So we feel like education is a great opener, gate opener to multiple other things. So that's one. The second thing is we've recently constructed and launched a certificate of executive leadership, which is um, aimed at our mid-tier staff. And we've absolutely made sure that it's incredibly diverse cohorts that have been selected to go through that so that you've got that. And that's accredited through AGSM. So it's the first time we've actually launched something where at the end of doing um, a six month experiential learning um, you'll actually end up with credit points towards doing a further degree with AGSM. So that's mid-level managers. And finally, we've actually launched something called Motivate, which I'm hoping some of you would have heard about. It's our new reward and performance system, but much more crucially in there is we actually embed in there conversations about career with your people leader. And that's where it's up to the employee to actually take the onus, have the quarterly conversations, and actually start mapping out your career paths through that. So those are kind of the main three vehicles currently that we've got in place. Are we, from seeing a cultural diverse CEO at a major organisation, rather than an American expat being flown in? Mm -hmm. Well, I really can't answer that. Um, basically, I think that we have a long way to go, so that's clearly an agreement. I think signing this blueprint is just an indicator that we're on the start of this journey. I think the next thing is to actually, as an organization, agree whether we're going to actually put a target aspirational figure out there. And I think that's the next bold step about whether we actually bite the bullet and say, we want to do X percent like you guys have done. We're actually not at that point yet. Fire them. Uh, I do think that we're a long way off. Obviously, it's good that we're starting to have these conversations, but I do realistically think we're a very long way off. Um, and given that gender equality issues are often given a lot more airtime, um, and we're not even there yet in terms of that gender balance in leadership, mm -hmm. I do think realistically there's a lot more work to do. So I'm starting a program where we've actually recognised we've got a lack of capability in the STEM discipline, so science, technology, engineering and maths. The businesses are crying out for it. So I've come up with a kind of innovative way of trying to get some STEM um, talent in. So I've gone to the group of eight universities, so the eight top national sandstone universities, for want of a better term, across the country, and I've asked them for PhD students that are currently willing to actually go part-time and work at Westpac three days a week whilst they complete their PhD studies. And it's quite a lucrative gig for them because they get paid quite well. Um, and when they gave me their list, they were 80% of it were, were male. And I had to go back to them and say, I'm not accepting any of this. I need you to go back and find me a gender balanced talent pool that I can then interview. So it's just starting at that point and pushing back every single time. So we used to do that for um, gender, now I'm doing it for cultural diversity. So that's the next step. So as I said, I think gender has been the forerunner for everything that we're trying to do. We at Westpac now feel we've kind of got a really good handle on that. And whilst we're not gonna take our eye off the ball, it's about maintaining that now. So the focus is now having a fulcrum shift into cultural diversity.
have a good fit with each of the team members. Like to a point where you're you're kind of friends, but you're not really friends, but you're kind of friends. You know what I mean? Like so you can tell them, yeah, you're gonna have to work back late tonight and not feel bad about it, but you can still get beers on Friday with them, right? Um, so yeah, I think I think it's dangerous territory to say um, I'm going to build a culturally diverse team and then set out to do that. I think you should find the best people for the job regardless of their race, right? Or their their fit, right? And then at that point, you'll actually see that um, all of those people start to have similar mentalities when you build the team together. That's what that's how we found. We had a, a culture. We have a culturally diverse team, not because we set out to build one, um, because we just found the best people for the job and like-minded people, and it just kind of happened that way. Like, it also like depends on what sort of environment you're in. Like if you're in the middle of Silicon Valley and every single person around you is a white Anglo-Saxon male, then maybe your team is going to be a whole bunch of them, and that that could be an issue because like. Um, and you can see stuff happening with Uber and things like that, right? Yeah. I was just going to say that wouldn't necessarily work at Westpac, where we have to actually make a conscious effort to identify that there is unconscious bias and people are going to hire not quite their buddies, but, you know, like-minded people. So we've got to actually have something that creates a nexus for us to actually just, you know, change the playing field a little bit and then get to that point. Diversity of thought, I don't think that cultural fit is necessarily helpful. We have a culturally diverse um, female GM on that IT team as well, the G at GM level. And um, unfortunately though, the representation of diversity, cultural diversity, and also with women in the broader IT space is um, not great. They're having trouble attracting and recruiting more females, but they would like to do better with that. Um, we are very culturally diverse with our IT team. However, we're not seeing that those numbers translating into our leadership. I would say leadership support and the HR support as well, which primarily lacked in India when I was working in the IT sector. But here I'm more keen to see how Westpac functions. Being new to Australia, that's one thing I'm looking out for because I definitely want to search ahead in the leadership roles as well. Well, there you go, Sandra. I was going to say, we have so much opportunity. There. We have to connect. <laughs> yes. Because okay, we've got all these amazing policies. It's about your people leader knowing what it is and utilising them. And you're actually doing some research on the internet as well and finding out what's there. Mm. Okay, so a large organisation brings uh, a great deal of benefit, but it also poses some challenges. So I guess it's harnessing the benefit. So one thing about large organisations, especially like Westpac, is the fact that it's very, very much relationship-based. So that's the first thing to understand in terms of system. So what you need to do is actually um, make sure you have a really good broad network of people. And so that takes you out of your comfort zone. You've got to call, call people, have coffees. Um, but what we'll throw up there is actually a number of opportunities. So when you're in an organisation the size of Westpac, the career opportunities are incredible. So it's about being able to tap into those opportunities and also having your own plan for where you want to land and not just leaving it to Big Brother to actually determine what your fate is going to be. So especially under the new Motivate system, there's an opportunity for you to actually career plan, create goals on a quarterly basis and actually get in front of your people leader if you're not having it and say, where's my quarterly conversation? It's not in the diary, I need to have it. That's number one. Number two is be very, very open to opportunities that come your way. So even if you weren't expecting something and it lands, you should assess it and then grab it if you think it might be a good fit. It's been fairly dismal and depressing. You just look at the US and see the worst kind of leadership out there. And it, it's also reflected as well in our own Australian system, like with Malcolm Turnbull as Prime Minister, showing a lack of leadership despite the potential that we all, and the, I guess the high hopes that we had of him. And similarly, like in the corporate sector, like for example, the recent retirement of Ian Arev at uh, the Commonwealth Bank. So today we've been talking about processes to support leadership, but do you think now is a good time to reassess what is the leadership, what qualities should be found in leadership for this new 21st century world? Yes, that's very much top of mind. So what we've done is actually built a strategy on what we think the workforce of 2025 is actually going to look like, and it actually went to board in June. 
And in that, it totally transforms what a leader of 2025 will look like. So it's more um, about the servant leadership model. It's nothing to do with hierarchy. It's about the right skills. It's about the right ethics and the principles that underpin it. Um, so what we have to do is now build programs of work and initiatives to actually move our people from their current concept of what traditional leadership might look like to actually this trust and empowered base. And it's a very big challenge very different, like a, a startup is you jump off a building and build an aeroplane on the way down and yeah. it flies, <laughs> right? Fly. Yeah, yeah, it's very, it's very different. Um, uh, what, one thought that I have um, is, do, do all these sort of um, rules and procedures and, and um, you know, kind of forcing people to act certain ways actually generate fear for actually finding leaders? Like, for example, someone who is a natural born leader doesn't actually know they're a leader until they're put in a situation where they can be one. Um, do, do your um, entities, create like ways that someone can um, you know shine above others in a low risk way Excellent. like without losing you know losing their job or something or taking a high risk you know in a bank I'm sure things can go wrong very quickly <laughs> so, so. and especially when um, being you know from from a Greek background which um, looks Middle Eastern when I go to the United States I know it sounds very surprising <laughs> uh, um, but especially like in the last um, in the last year or so, traveling to and from the United States a lot, right? Um, a friend of mine is a, is a Muslim and um, he works at, at Google. Um, he's a very, very smart guy. And I remember last time we were in the States, we went to the Google headquarters over in Silicon Valley and we were taking some selfies and stuff next to the, um, next to the Google signs. And the security guard came up to us and asked us to leave. And we were like, okay, well, why? And he pretty much said it because we were like scoping out the place because we thought we were terrorists.